Uh, this is work in collaboration with my colleague and friend Richard Sprout, who you heard from earlier today. Um, let me begin. The remarks I'm going to give today are directed primarily at the speech and language processing community. And while what we have to say, I believe, needs to be said, some of the points I'm going to be making may be obvious to this current audience. So I, I present that as a caveat before I proceed. Let's begin with two quick definitions to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. I'll be referring quite a bit to language and writing. I need to differentiate between the two. Uh, by language, we refer to the ability to externalize complex mental propositions. This is a evolutionary ability that appears probably sometime during what's called the Middle Stone Age, uh, the, roughly at the time, the dawn of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Um, this ability has the unique feature that it is acquired more or less effortlessly, uh, barring um, developmental or congenital dis disorders or sensory or motor impairments. Um, by writing, we essentially adopt the definition given quite a long time ago by Gelb, which sees writing as a technology that allows us to create discrete, durable, physical records of spoken language. Um, this is a technology and it can only be mastered by conscious determined study in contrast to language which is acquired more or less effortlessly. Um, writing has, has to be invented and it has, or developed and it has been uh, developed only a few times independently. Um, first in the Near East, um, it's unclear whether the Mesopotamian or Egyptian inventions are independent or not. Um, again, in China and finally in Central America. For a variety of historical and sociological reasons, nearly, nearly all uh, research done under the rubric of natural language processing involves text processing, processing written documents of some sort and work on spoken and signed languages, as well as most of the work in sort of multimodal modal areas dealing with things like uh, images and sound, in addition to uh, written language, is largely relegated to other venues. So this area we call NLP, natural language processing, is almost exclusively written language processing. And it also should be added that much, much of the work on spoken language processing involves written text, either as an input or an output. This largely unacknowledged focus on written language in these enormous research areas has led to substantial confusion among NLP practitioners. Very few of them will have studied the world's writing systems in any detail. So both um, my co-author and I have both taught graduate classes on writing systems, usually housed in linguistics departments. But these classes are not widely taught um, in North America at all. In fact, I went looking to see if anyone else had taught one, and the only other person I could find was Richard. Um, here's our proposal. It's a very simple one. Uh, NLP researchers should clearly and explicitly differentiate between language and writing when they talk about this topic. So they should not conflate language or writing or a language and a script that's used to write it or the properties of that script with the properties of the language it is used to write. This conflation, I think, is to be expected given what has traditionally been called uh, standard language ideologies. Um, this is sort of the dominant naive view of how language works and operates in uh, the developed world. And there's a, there's a collection of ideologies, but one of the ones that the B. Green, who coined this term, points out is the view that written language is superior, if not also logically prior to spoken language. Obviously, uh, the exact opposite is true. Uh, as I said, spoken language is evolutionarily somewhat distant, whereas written language is a relatively recent technology that depends heavily on spoken language. Now, I should note that certain scripts do have, do seem to have affordances for writing certain types of languages. So one classic uh, point is that it's long been suspected that consonantal alphabets or objects, as they're sometimes called, are well suited to represent templatic word formation in the Semitic languages. And um, so they may be well adapted for that kind of language. Um, another point made by Richard is that um, the, the two times we've seen so-called morphographic scripts 
be created, um, the languages they were used to first write, um, in these languages, most stems are monosyllabic. Um, so these, these particular scripts may be well suited for writing that kind of thing or, or evolved in that context. But these linguistic properties are not necessary conditions because um, consonantal alphabets have been used um, for dozens of languages without these properties. The biggest predictor of whether you use a consonantal alphabet essentially is whether you have a history of, uh, whether you, you are sort of associated with a regional hegemony of, um, of Islam or uh, other, other religions in the area. So you see these quite a bit um, in the Middle East and Central Asia. Not surprising. The same thing is true with um, the Han characters, which are early morphographic script, which use these. And the Chinese characters have been used to write all kinds of languages that don't have this property of most stems being monosyllabic. So clearly, this is not a determinant factor. Um, so we shouldn't over we shouldn't overestimate this effect. So, what should one not say? Well, I've taken some examples from the ACL anthology. This is the central repository for virtually all journals and conference proceedings um, in the field of natural language processing. There's a bit of speech processing in these uh, things, but it's mostly about processing written language. I've also uh, hidden the citations to protect the accused. I don't want to, as we say, put anyone on blast. Um, these errors are common enough that I wouldn't want to call out any one particular author or set of authors for them. But of course, you can just search the ACL anthology and find these quotes if you need to verify that I'm not making them up. Um, the first descriptions here are, we see that uh, right to left languages such as Arabic and Hebrew, or since Persian is a right to left language. Now it's true that these scripts are read right to left, but under modern computing circumstances, which one is working either with Unicode code points or perhaps UTF-8 encoded Unicode text. This is merely a property of the rendering system. The code points or the UTF-8 bytes are in the same logical order as in any other text. Um, so this basically has no effect at all if you are just, unless, unless you're doing sort of visual text processing, if you're working with uh, the text itself, it doesn't matter at all. And of course, there's absolutely nothing about the language itself that is right to left. These are just languages which are traditionally, um, whose most common script is traditionally read right to left. Nothing deeper than that. Um, another quote here we see, one more idiosyncrasy of the Arabic language, should be the Arabic writing system, is that it is a consonantal language. Well, obviously, all every language has consonants, so that can't be what the author possibly means. What they must mean instead is that they are referring to the consonantal alphabetic script used to write Arabic. This script writes all consonants and it writes long vowels, but short vowels are generally omitted except in certain religious and pedagogical texts. And when they're present, they're indicated with what are essentially diacritics. The, well, templatic word formation in Semitic languages may make them uniquely suited for this type of defective writing, the absence of short vowels, Dozens of languages which lack these properties are written using the script over history. Um, dozens and dozens and dozens of languages throughout um, Eastern, uh, Southeastern Europe, um, the Near and Middle East, into uh, the, the subcontinent, all have been written historically with these continental alphabetic scripts. Yet all of the other languages lack these particular morphological processes that supposedly make these ideal. So once again, there's nothing consonantal about Arabic as a language. And, there's, um, and the fact that it's consonantal isn't even particularly, as a script, isn't particularly relevant to any of the points being made. This one is particularly confusing. Punjabi is a syllabic language. Just like every language has consonants, every language has a unit we might call syllables. So presumably, this is referring to the alpha syllabary used to write Punjabi in India. Now, alpha syllabaries are not syllabaries. And while there's a unit in their description called the orthographic syllable, these have not that much to do with uh, linguistic notions of what a syllable is or phonological syllables. And of course, if you go to the next country over, the language Punjabi is also written using a consonantal alphabet, an object, which isn't syllabic at all. 
Um, so clearly there's nothing special about either Punjabi as a language or about the two scripts used to write it um, that could fall under the rubric syllabic. For whatever reason, this confusion and conflation is particularly common when talking about Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Um, these three languages are often grouped together as CJK in um, the sort of computational world um, because, well, presumably because all three of them are large, are spoken by large and relatively well off populations, and all three of them are sufficiently different from uh, the alpha, sort of our alphabetic norms in the West. So here are some things you might see. You might see Chinese described as morphemic, syllabic, logographic, or ideographic, um, among other things. So I'll assume that you understand uh, that Chinese is not ideographic. In fact, um, no writing system is ideographic. Uh, all writing systems depend on, in part, a linguistic analysis. This linguistic analysis may be somewhat naive. It may be quite sophisticated. It depends. And this linguistic analysis has a phonological and or morphological component. This point was made most clearly by John DeFrancis in the 80s and um, has been reiterated many times since then. In fact, it is likely impossible to construct a purely ideographic symbol system that would satisfy any meaningful definition of writing. Now, there is a well-known attempt, um, and it is not terribly successful. Here are some general purpose problems that one could sort of deduce from first principles for developing a truly ideographic writing system. So the obvious problems are the, how one might go about encoding proper names, um, Kyle, Shibuya, uh, colors, uh, like chartreuse, uh, non-imageable predicates, like imagine freedom, and also encode subtle connotative differences um, that, um, that are not strictly a uh, semantic in notion, things like the distinction in register and intent between a term like salt versus sodium chloride versus one in English can say NaCl, and be understood that one is referring to uh, table salt. Now, uh, this, this comes from uh, Richard's discussion of a attempt to develop an a fully ideographic writing system called Bliss Symbolics or Bliss Symbols, created by a man named Karl Blitz. Um, Blitz uh, fled, um, fled the rise of the Nazis um, in the run-up to World War II and found himself briefly in Shanghai, where he came into limited contact with Chinese, he, which he Despite he never uh, built a full competence, he believed it to be to be fully ideographic and set about developing a system on the basis of his misunderstanding about how Chinese worked. Um, here are some of the problems that the system runs into, even though it's relatively rich and well developed. Um, indicating different types of waterfowl requires subscripts, so a goose is a is a waterfowl subscript too. Um, countries are indicated with flat by using sort of outlines in grayscale of their flags, which makes it completely impossible to indicate all the, the distinction between all the different uh, tricolor flags which are split um, into three boxes. Um, so Belgium, Italy, and Mexico all look the same. So one needs to innovate superscripts and conventionalize what they're supposed to mean. Uh, colors are particularly bad too. All colors are indicated with a, a circle with a dot, an underscore, and then a subscript. Uh, Persian blue is subscript 87. Uh, one has to memorize these sort of things to use the system. So given that uh, Chinese or Japanese is not in any meaningful sense ideographic, we wanted to understand what authors are trying to say when they claim it is. The way we tackle this is quite simple. We conducted a survey. We searched for these terms, uh, terms like ideograph, spelled correctly and incorrectly, and ideographic on the ACL anthology website, which has, as I said, virtually every published work in the field of natural language processing. And we went back to 2003, so about 20 years of coverage. Um, and for each example we found, we coded whether the, uh, which languages and or writing systems the term was, um, was referring to, if it was possible to tell, um, whether or not the expression there sort of conflated language and writing, and finally, we tried to the best of our ability to code what the author's intent was when mentioning this notion in the first place. Um, the slides are online, I believe, and there's a link to the survey results at the bottom here if you want to see it. It's simply an online spreadsheet. So 
So we got 50 results uh, from the ACL anthology survey. Um, Chinese and Japanese, um, surprisingly, are most commonly described as idiographic, as is Korean at some point. Of course, Korean has a small number of the, of the Chinese origin Han characters used in it, but it's really a quite small portion of the of normal Korean text. Um, yet, so it's a little bit uh, a little bit superfluous. Um, Akkadian and Egyptian, both um, ancient and uh, dead writing systems, are mentioned as well. Um, the bliss symbols are correctly described as geographic, at least that was the intent. Um, somewhat confusingly, Dutch and Indo Aryan are described as. Um, as uh, ideographic, it's not really clear what was intended there. Uh, Dutch, Dutch is written in an alphabet, and um, their Indo-Aryan languages are written in a variety of different types of scripts. Uh, Proto-Elamite is also described as ideographic. Uh, that's interesting because no one knows what Proto-Elamite says or whether it was even a writing system. Um, it's un completely undeciphered, though it was you know, used in an area that had many what we might call morphographic scripts because it was you know, adjacent to uh, uh, Acadia and places of that nature. Um, many of these examples clearly conflate writing and language. They say things like uh, Chinese is an ideographic language instead of Chinese is written with using an ideographic script. Um, by far, the most common reason to simply mention ideography is to describe the Han characters. They simply want us to let us know that Chinese is not written in an alphabet. That's all they really have to say is, hey, there's this thing Chinese and it's written in a different system than you might be familiar with. Um, not uncommonly, though, another motivation is to talk about the problems with uh, segmenting uh, text in Chinese or Japanese. Um, as you may understand, uh, when one does natural language processing, one sort of needs to chunk up the uh, byte sequence or the you know, code, code point sequences into word or morph like units um, to do further processing most of the time at least. Um, and this is essentially trivial in a language like English, um, but it can be quite hard in a language like Chinese. It's been studied quite a bit. Um, one needs clever algorithms to sort of chunk the pieces together into meaningful units, um, often driven by machine learning. And often simply mentioning the Chinese ideographs is a way to lead into that discussion about what we're going to do in that subject. Quite often though, we simply have, no, I had no clue what the author intended about mentioning this fact, it just seems to be a fact out of nowhere that leads nowhere. Now, um, virtually all NLP research appears in one location, but there's no similar repository for speech processing, unfortunately. Um, thank you, Jan, for acknowledging the five minutes. Um, there's no similar repository for speech processing. So we instead search simply Google Scholar um, with for the term ideographic, by far that was the most common uh, sort of form of this word, and then either speech recognition or speech synthesis. And as one may know, if you put this in quotes, it forces the thing to be relatively um, relatively strict and as opposed to sort of doing fuzzy matching there and you get, um, we got plenty of results there. This found examples from proceedings of conferences like ICASP, Interspeech, ASRU, et cetera. We went back once again to 2003. So this had a similar effect in terms of what it netted um, to what we find in the ACL anthology, but for the speech world. Um, we once again look at 50 examples here. Um, most commonly described as ideographic, once again, are Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Many of the examples conflate writing and language. And once again, the most common reason to mention ideography is simply to describe or introduce even the fact that Chinese is not written in alphabet or that Japanese is not. And very little else is intended in most cases. So quickly to summarize our, our brief survey results, ideograph and similar terms are often used simply to describe or introduce the scripts, which use the Han characters. And usually very little is intended beyond that. Um, about 20% of the time, the authors clearly uh, make a clear and incorrect conflation of writing and language. Though we note in a few cases, um, the terms are actually used to describe, are used correctly to describe symbols like the dollar sign or one, two, and three, the Arabic numerals, which I think are best understood as, as ideograms. I don't think that's incorrect, um, though one would be hard pressed to call um, the English writing system ideographic, and it would be simply 
logically incorrect to say that English is an ideographic language or something like that. So this leads me, as I conclude, to uh, three sets of suggestions. Um, we think that the original sin here is act was the one committed by the Unicode Consortium. It is the time has come for the Unicode Consortium to repent and make amends for their abuse of the term ideograph. They refer to the Han characters as CJK Unified Ideographs. They have a note about this in their FAQ on the CJK languages. And it notes that uh, the term is linguistically incorrect, so they claim it was, uh, our, this is the general usage in English that the, the Chinese characters are generally referred to as ideographs. I'd say, I'd say they're not generally referred to at all. It's not a major topic of discussion outside of a specialist area and specialists ought to know what these things actually are and what these terms mean. Um, Unicode, as they know, um, used the term ideograph um, when they built their standard. The term is now so, so pervasive in the standard that it cannot be abandoned. I think that's complete nonsense. It could be, uh, it could be sort of uh, found and replaced. It could be gone tomorrow um, since they control the, the standard and they issue a new one every couple of years. Um, what should replace it? Well, one proposal I find um, inoffensive is the proposal to replace it with the term cinegraph as proposed by Handel. But there are many other good options. I think Han characters would suffice as well. Secondly, editors, area chairs, and reviewers um, should insist on adherence to these principles if, um, if they find this uh, pre presentation convincing. Um, I know Richard and I have caught many such issues while reviewing, but researchers in general should be aware of these issues. And we hope that this contribution will give people a place to direct um, interested uh, parties to learn about these issues. It might also be time for a special interest group in writing systems, perhaps associated with the ACL. That could get the attention of the NLP community. And I think there is some real interest in the computational analysis of writing systems as meetings like this show us. Final suggestion. There's been this recent trend in the NLP world to describe uh, neural network systems as from scratch. These are systems that work not by tokenizing the text into word-like units, but rather working at the level of individual Unicode code points or in some cases, even like UTF-8 encoded byte strings. There's an implication in this literature, sometimes explicit, that these from scratch approaches have simply eliminated the need for linguistic insight altogether. But writing systems are a type of linguistic analysis. And while the analyses can be naive, they often encode sophisticated insights in a symbolic form. They've done all the hard work of, of chunking this uh, complicated uh, spoken language into meaningful units. Such models should not be described as working from scratch because writing is not from scratch. And thank you for your time. I will um, exit out here and take any questions if time allows. Thank you. Any questions? I, I see here there's a quick uh, note from um, uh, Cornelia, hello about ideogram. I may have searched for that. I, it may not have been very common, um, but that, that would be useful. I'll go check to see if that's uh, pervasive and with that would, whether that would inform our survey. I'll, I can follow up on that um, as per your suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering how come uh, Dutch can be considered as being ideographic? Is there some psychoanalytic side on this? Uh, somebody considering Dutch to be so obscure that it can only be compared to Chinese? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not the easiest spelling system I've ever seen. Um, and perhaps it's a bit like, I, I don't know enough to say, perhaps it's a bit like English in that, um, uh, as Richard said in his uh, keynote about that it has some sort of logographic components in the spelling system. In fact, I think it does in the same way English does. Um, but I'd have to go back and uh, pull that. It's you, you can look at our spread at our spreadsheet and find the uh, link back to the ACL anthology to see what the person had to say about Dutch. Okay. So no other question. Thank you very much, Kyle. Mm -hmm.